Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be discussing the fourth and final movement of Bach's Sonata No. 3 in C major. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some of the general issues that pertain to all of the sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. It's interesting that, you know, the question is whether Bach really intended his cycle to be you know, sonata partita, sonata partita, sonata partita. There's definitely a lot of internal symmetry as regards the progression of the three partitas and the progression of the three sonatas, but I really do think he intended them as pairs. And it's interesting that the last movement of the third sonata, the next movement that appears in the cycle is the first movement of the E major, the famous E major prelude. And I really feel like this movement has a lot of that same brilliant aesthetic. They almost feel like, uh, a bit like, like siblings or something. So there's a lot of multiple voice going on in this single stop movement. Is there even a single double stop in here? Nope, not a single one. And yet there are definitely places where it sounds like lots of violins playing. Measure five, for example. Here's your bass note. And then your upper voice. such a way that it, you can really hear and feel the dialogue going on. Another one in measure 21. Or you could do it the other way. And then the other go out goes. More polyphony. Bass notes. Upper voice notes. Now we have middle voice joining the fray. Etc. Then we've got a little dialogue at 37. So upper voice, lower voice, etc. All of those same spots occur also in the second half. You can find them for yourself. They're pretty obvious. Um, but then there are a couple of new sections, measure 63, um, where we have and then this kind of stuff, one voice, and then that same low voice again. So whatever you do, you don't want to make it linear, like all the notes belong to the same thing as it's going along. That sounds like it's just one violin playing all of that stuff, but make it sound like it's this guy doing this and this guy doing that. Here's middle voice. Here's lower voice. So there's always conversation. And then you have a spot where you have pedal points, but they're really unusual pedal points because they're in the topmost voice, and not just the topmost most voice, a, a really high topmost voice, all the way here at our, you know, sort of highest note of the piece moment, measure 89. Those are clearly, you know, organ pedal kind of notes, but yet here they are in these squeaky little high notes. And then the other voice. So we have to hear, right? Of course, bar our finger across the fifth. So it's I'm trying to show you the polyphony and play at the same time, it's making it a little little hard. Let me just play it without thinking about it and see what you can hear. So 
basically trying to make it sound like multiple voices at the same time most of the time throughout this movement in whatever way you might interpret that as you know which note belongs to which voice but they never all belong to the same linear thing. There's a lot of Boeing stuff to consider. First of all, um, the opening statement, of course we have to phrase these five notes together. I hope our E string doesn't squeak. Then this seven note phrase, or even peppier perhaps. So then a three note slur. I love how Bach mixes it up. Five note slur, seven note slur, five note slur, three note slur. He's just always making things as complicated as he can. And then here, a lot of people in measure six, like measure 48 or whatever, they will do these inside out things, slurry. But what about if you just do it as it comes? Like we talked about in the C major fugue, sometimes doing, doing these what might seem like inside out bowings, bow circles from lower string, high string to lower string here, actually gives it more articulation. Here it sort of rounds it out. Nothing wrong with doing that if you're more comfortable or if you're using a modern bow, you probably have to do it that way. But with a Baroque bow, you can get away with doing the print and it does give it a certain character that doing the inside out or the, you know, backward slur one doesn't do. So I'd encourage you to give it a try, at least see if you can make it work for you. Um, then we have to do something in 20, um, 26 because otherwise we're going to be back there, backwards there. Well, I mean, I guess you could do it that way, but I find it to be more comfortable. Two ups. So be down bow on 27. So another up, up, up here. And of course that's all fine. Um, same thing of course at 74. And then when we're coming out of the slurry part, the part with all the four note slurs in a row, I do two ups here in measure 40, same thing in measure 100, so that I'm back to a down bow there. You could add a slur, but I think that's more harmful here. It still sounds like what he wrote, as long as you don't, you're not making them into one slur, just... end a movement da 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 on the third beat like that da 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 bum ba da 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 so the rest of the notes of that last measure of the first half and the second half are just kind of tailing away from that da 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 um, even though this has been such a grand sonata, um, it doesn't mean that your last note has to be mm. we already got to do that um, in sonata number two <laughs> But that was a beat. This one is not a beat. So that's just kind of doing something that doesn't work. So you can keep it strong if you want to, but make sure that it feels like one, two, three, that the whole last measure is a gesture. Measure 63, um, of course, is as it comes, but then an uppo here. Same thing. I take an up bow. Some people do hooks and backwards bowing. Just for the sake of the bow distribution, but you can save your bow. And then travel a little bit. And after all, these notes are leading anyway, so the, the kind of growing that happens when you travel actually works for the music. And then Bach has, you know, we were talking about that place, um, where was it? The da 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 yeah, measure 26. Now, in measure 75, Bach has an eight note slur. 
73, he doesn't. <laughs> Did he want something different because of the harmony? Maybe he wants that gooier. It means 76 comes out down bow, which is kind of nice. But um, yeah, I haven't quite reconciled myself to that eight note slur. I probably ought to, but. You know what it is? I like hitting this polyphonic note on the A string on a new bow. And if I goo it together, it's not quite as easy. I guess I just don't quite see the point of the eight notes, sir. It doesn't seem to add a lot and it makes it feel more awkward, but who knows, in 10 years I might be like, oh, I love that eight note slur, who knows. But for now, I just change it into two four note slurs to, and I think there's nothing wrong with doing that if you want. Um, now, this whole section starting at 77, we end up, if we do the print, we end up um, backwards bowing. Up bow. We could take two ups so that we're the same every time. And here he puts it, the eight notes slur sooner, then we're down bow and ready to go on. So that solution does work. Um, we could also do it as it comes. And now we're backwards. Backwards. I don't love the backwards 16th, but I love the fact that I get to play 84 on a down bow, and the only way that I'm going to do that is if I play 83, doing that backwards with up, down, up, down, up, down, and the, if I'm doing 83, up, down, up, down, then it would make sense to do 79, up, down, up, down. So that's why I do it as it comes, because then I get to do that on a down bow, and then I have to make up for it with two up bows right here to get back to a down bow here. Make sure you have some phrasing here. All right, so yeah, it's hard to find solutions occasionally, but um, just keep fooling around with it and see what feels good. Harmonies to pay attention to. Let's see, um, well, measure 15, for example, we're in C major. <laughs> kind of A7 um, in measure 18, then D minor, but not really because now we're back in C major. So just paying attention to kind of these little moments. Um, there is A minor, of course, at the start of 77 where we were just talking about, um, and then a whole lot of minor in the second half. Um, so, you know, after we have our friendly section at 47, and then in 54, then D minor, and that stays for a while, 63. Seems like F major, but not really. So then, still D minor, um, and then A minor in 77, but we've been minor for a while. So there's lots of minor key, and then eventually, of course, it lightens up and brightens to G major at that wonderful spot at 89, and then C minor, the murky bit before it goes back to major, the other murky bit, of course, being 37. So thinking about the colors, I think those murky bits, 37 and 97, are actually maybe a little softer. Um, and then the, the you know, more angsty minor key stuff, I, I tend to play, um, you know, 47 is, is extroverted and brilliant, but then measure 55, I play even like more aggressive and, you know, kind of dark and, and you know, full of angst. Um, you could see it the other way. You could make it um, sweeter somehow. So, you could totally pull.
pull that off. Any number of options, but make sure that you really know where your keys are and that you choose your characters so that they have a kind of logic with different keys having different colors and different moods and stuff like that. Well, those are some of my thoughts about the C major Allegro Asai. So this is Rachel Barton Pine, and thank you for watching RBP on JSB.